What's up everybody and welcome to another board game cube shelf run through. My name is JB and we are going to be going through the fifth shelf out of 16 here and we're going to jump right in. So let's go ahead and continue with the repost production games as we look at this one. When I Dream. Now this is a bit of an unusual one because I haven't actually played it yet. I won it in a raffle last year at a local game store for like $2, and I wasn't even looking to get it, but it looked interesting, and I heard good things about it, so I went for it, ended up winning it. It's a party game, so unfortunately, you can see down here it says 4 to 10 players. Unfortunately, this one is probably not going to get played until the lockdown is over, which hopefully will be happening soon. But um, you can see here on the back that it's kind of like in a game in the vein of Dixit and other more creatively oriented party games with this uh, very surreal artwork uh, on the cards. But it seems to also be kind of a social deduction game as well, where one person uh, puts on this mask, like a sleep mask, and um, they are labeled the dreamer. And then the other people like describe the cards or something. And then they have to like piece together the dream at the end. But then there's one or two people who are like boogeymen and they're trying to distract the dreamer from actually getting it all right. And yeah, it's, it's a really interesting concept, it seems like. I haven't really looked into it too deeply, but I'm looking forward to checking this out afterwards. And I just noticed something. Circus, that was used as an example on just one from last time. Repos must really like circus stuff. Well, anyway, that's when I dream. Okay, the next game, I'm going to put this off to the side for now, uh, because I wanted to talk about this one here first. This next one I'm probably going to spend a little bit of time on, and that is Seven Wonders. So Seven Wonders is the game that probably more than anything else was responsible for getting me into modern hobby board gaming. It was 2011, and we were uh, with a gathering of friends, and there was a friend of mine who brought this game. Um, he and his fiance had learned it together, and so they wanted to share it with us. And it scaled up to seven people. And so I played it, and I was just immediately struck by how different it was compared to the kinds of games I had grown up on. And I think that was kind of what drew me to it so much, was that it shattered so many what I'll call conventions that I had associated with board games. For one thing, everybody took their turns at the same time, but it wasn't like chaotic, like a party game. For another thing, there were multiple ways to get points, so it wasn't just a get to the finish line first, like Parcheesi or something like that, where you roll a die and move. Um, there was a lot of other things, like the fact that there was beautiful artwork on the cards and everything. And that was the thing, it's just that there was all these conventions that were just getting toppled in my head, like, oh my goodness, this is actually really interesting. So the premise of Seven Wonders is that you are building, like, a civilization, but it's all in, like, 30 minutes or so, and there's three rounds during which you draft cards. Now, tr card drafting as a mechanism is a very interesting one, and you can see how dilapidated this box has gotten. It's been played so much, but um, each person has a hand of cards in this case, and what you do is you pick one card to play with, and then you pass the others to um, your left or right, depending on which round it is. And you can do different things with the cards. Most of the time you'll be building them, but you can also discard them for money or use them to build up your wonder. And uh, I love this system. Like, but each round the cards get progressively more and more powerful. There's different suits of cards. Like, these are resources, and these are commerce-related, and then that's science and military and so on. I think what really captivated me about this was that there was this sense of progression. Like I was getting more and more powerful. It wasn't just a slog to get to the very end of the game. And I really appreciated that element of it. I, I loved it so much that every time we got together and he brought it, I just kept, kept wanting to play it over and over again. And eventually I got my own copy of it. There's also expansions for it, which I've managed to fit here in the box via an insert. Uh, that add more cards, it adds leaders for uh, kind of giving you a, a little bit more strategy if you want to do plan more long-term and whatnot, more wonders, you know, more game-changing things. It's just a very accessible game. It's not necessarily, I, I know I've mentioned it as kind of my, as what a lot of people call gateway game. I don't know if I would say it's a gateway game for everybody because it's got a lot of iconography, and I know not everyone is necessarily bent toward iconography, but the nice thing about the way we played it first was that when the guy introduced it to us, 
he actually had us play open-handed the first time, and that allowed us to ask him questions about the icons and whatnot, so that really helped a lot. So if you ever want to introduce this to friends who are maybe not quite so, you know, game uh, experienced, that might be good just to, you know, get have them get a feel for it. So that's Seven Wonders, definitely a very fun game. All right, put that aside, and we're going to move on to um, the follow-up to Seven Wonders, Seven Wonders Duel. This, this is the second two-player version of a game uh, that I've shown off here. The other one was King Domino Duel. And this one, I was kind of a little hesitant on at first because it was being billed as a two-player version of Seven Wonders when the game already had a two-player variant, but it was kind of a little awkward. It involved a dummy player, and it was a little strange, whereas this one was more of a direct tug-of-war kind of thing. I love the way this works because you kind of have like a card pyramid in front of you that you're both working with, and the more you remove cards, the more you unlock the cards that are face down. So when you take cards, you're potentially giving your opponent a really good card, depending on what it is, so you have to be careful. And then you have wonders that you can build here, and these wonders may give you like extra turns in a row, which you can use to kind of disrupt the parity of turns. Um, there are things that you can do, like moving along military, which in this case is like a track that's a tug-of-war kind of thing. And there's so many different things that are cool about this, but what I really like about it is that there are different win conditions. So it's not just like the original game where there's different ways to get points, and the condition is whoever has the most points wins. It's literally there are different ways to achieve victory and call the game done. So if you make it all the way through on the military track to attack your opponent, then you you instantly win. If you collect like a bunch of different science symbols, I think you win that way as well. And of course, there's the traditional point victory if you manage to not achieve either one of those two. But just the thought that those things could happen gives the game this incredibly juicy tension. I love it. It's such a fun game. I've played with one of the expansions. I don't own it, but even just the base game is just solid. Very, very cool. Has the exact same gorgeous artwork, but uh, new pictures. Highly recommend this one, too. All right, that is it for reposts. So we're going to move on to Dice Forge, which is a, published by a company named Libelude. They're the ones who did Dixit, um, which I don't own. But this game is kind of an unknown gem. Like, uh, some people know about it. And it's available for free on the website boardgamearena.com. But this game is a very interesting um, dice-building game. And uh, the way it woke, oh, I missed a, a trick with the, the box covers here. The way it works is that you have these, these dice that have detachable faces. You, you start with these two dice and they, they're all pre-configured. But what you can do is that this tray thing here has new faces that you can use to get your uh, die upgraded. And you can detach them like Lego pieces and put these new faces on, and then you can buy these cards that give you points and allow you to do special abilities and attack your opponents in some cases. It's a really neat game, and I think what I like about it is that more so than a lot of other engine-building games, there's a certain level of tactile attachment that you get from working on these dice, and I, I just really like that a lot. There's also, despite the fact that the base game is pretty simple, there's also a lot of really neat ways to customize the dice such that you can play very different games. And so far, I mean, with a few exceptions, when I've played this game online with people, which has been great during the lockdown, by the way, people have done very different things with their dice, and they're all pretty viable, which I really appreciate. You don't have to think too hard about it. Really neat game. You're getting things on everyone's turns and you're rolling the dice so you're constantly engaged, much like Space Base. So very, very neat game. Got some pretty artwork as well. Uh, and it's a, got a phenomenal insert here where you can put the dice face tray here as well. Everything fits so perfectly in this box. That is Dice Forge. Okay, we have a couple of small games here. Starting with, we didn't play test this at all. This is kind of my entry in the whole exploding kittens kind of game where, you know, everything's chaotic. There's a little bit of player elimination and whatnot. But this game is a very short one where you can play, I think it's two to eight, no, two to ten, it says right there, people. 
you can play with a bunch of people and you deal out like one card to each of them. And all these cards are very plain looking, but they have text on them that's pretty funny. And the text uh, tells you, you know, if you do this, then you get eliminated. Or, you know, you have to do this thing on your turn or you're going to get eliminated. One of my favorite ones that just sent me into like a three-minute laughing fit when I first played this game was uh, there's a card that's called I Lose. And I'm actually going to try to find it here because I got a real kick out of this when I first played it. But it's spelled like lowercase i, capital L, O-S-E, kind of like iPhone. And uh, the I Lose card... Oh, here's a funny one. Comic Sans, placed in front of you. Every player must say, Comic Sans is awesome before playing a card on their turn, or they lose. Yes, this is an evil card. Yeah, I cannot say that without grimacing. Uh, but the I lose card, not, not this one. This is <laughs> this is called I lose, where you just instantly lose. Um, but the one that's formatted like iPhone should be somewhere around here. I'm going to find it. But it, it had this flavor text on it, and... Uh, there's a bunch of blank ones, apparently. Um, uh, where are you? It said something like, if you are looking at your phone when this card is played, you instantly lose. And I cracked up so hard at this. Let's see. Where are you? Uh, I never noticed this before. <laughs> I think my friend Flynn wrote that. I didn't know that. Notice that he invented his own card here. Okay. Uh, where is this? Is it seriously down here? Oh, I bet I know what it is. It was with another set. I don't actually own that set. Okay, never mind. But anyway, the, the whole premise of that card was that if you were looking at your phone, then you instantly lose a game. And I thought it was so funny that this game had this social commentary about people looking at their phones while they were at the table and everything. I, It just really cracked me up, and I, I just loved it. So I don't know how long I'm going to keep this one. Uh, one of my friends ended up getting this game for his birthday, and I, I may just end up playing his copy of it. It's not really one of my favorites. I just thought, oh, I should own this because it made me laugh <laughs> a bunch. Normally, I'm not really a fan of, like, really chaotic games, but it is a fun one if you're into that kind of stuff. I like how it says that there's a banana, banana included, but then it says banana sold separately in very fine text there. All right, uh, another two-player game here, and this starts the string of games by uh, this publisher here, Renegade Game Studios. Uh, this is the Fox in the Forest. This is a two-player trick-taking card game. Uh, and this is, a, this is kind of a, an unusual one, but I really like it a lot. It's a card game where there's these three suits. You have bells and keys and moons, I think. And uh, there's three suits, and you are trying to win tricks. But the, the key to this game is that you don't want to win too many tricks. It even says right here, if you get greedy and win too many, you will fall like the villain in many fairy tales. So there's all these fairy tale characters on the odd-numbered cards, and they all do special things whenever you play them. But the even-numbered cards look a lot like normal playing cards, except with the, the special suits on them. So what you're doing is that you're having to kind of do this tug-of-war back and forth where you're goading your opponent into winning tricks that you may not want to win because you don't want to lose points at the end of the round or get um, you know, not as many as your opponent would. So you get these tokens here to, you know, denote, like, how many points you get based on, like, a chart and whatnot. It's a really neat game, and it's it's got a very fun dynamic. This is one that I brought on a few first dates, and everyone's really enjoyed it. It's it's a really neat, calm game, and it, it honestly feels like it's a game that could have come out decades ago. Like, it could have been around for a long time. It's it's that kind of classic feeling game, and it's it feels very... Very comfort food-esque is the best way I can put it. So check this one out if you like trick-taking games. It's, it's a really neat one. All right, we have two more here. Oh, and by the way, you're wondering probably about those two boxes in the back there. Those are expansions for Dice Forge and Seven Wonders that are not in the main box just because I can't fit them. And uh, But they do together take up the space that one of the other uh, one of their associated boxes base game boxes would take up so thankfully they fit pretty neat, nicely back there if i ever want to dig them out but i'm not going to go over those here all right we have 
Deception Murder in Hong Kong. All right, so this is, I think, the last party game, like, like the last, what most people would agree on as a party game uh, here on the shelves. And uh, this one is published by a company named Gray Fox. I think they um, they reprinted it, or at least they distributed it in the, or published it in this part of the world uh, from this Chinese publisher here, who was the original publisher. Uh, but this game uh, originally came from Hong Kong, I believe, and it's a uh, it's a very interesting social deduction game that's very similar to Werewords, which we talked about last time. And uh, what I like about it is that this is a great game to play, one, if you like storytelling, but two, if you are normally averse to social deduction games because, you know, you, you're bad at lying maybe or you're just not very comfortable with it, uh, this game is great because you don't really have to worry so much about that. You can easily direct suspicion to other players. And uh, what's really interesting about it is that each player gets a secret role like most social deduction games, but then they also get these uh, four cards that have clues that would be found at a crime scene and then what the game calls means, which are different methods of murder. And one of the players, much like the mayor in Werewords, is a silent narrator of sorts who is trying to give help to all the other players, but one of them is, or more of them, are the uh, murderer or the murderer and accomplice, and they are trying to distract everybody else. So what the what the murderer does is they point to one of their meat clue cards and one of their means cards, and that's the answer to the puzzle. And then the, um, the forensic scientist, I think is the name of the person giving the clues out, they take these tiles right here, and they use these bullet markers to mark down one of the items here, denoting, you know, some aspect of the crime. And so what they're doing is they're essentially piecing a story together about how everything happened. But of course, there's that communication barrier of being silent, and, you know, people are kind of going, okay... I think they're trying to tell us that it happened like this, but that may not be exactly what you were intending. And much like uh, Werewords, there's a role called the witness, much like the seer, where they know the answer, but they can't be too obvious about knowing the answer or the murderer can identify them at the end. So it's a very neat game. If you like Clue, this is a really fun one. Check it out. It's, it supports up to 12 uh, with the base game. There's also an expansion, which I don't own, um, but just the base game is a lot of fun. All right, and finally, continuing on with the Renegade Train, we have Terror Below, or as I like to call it, Tremors the Game. Uh, this is another game by Renegade, and this was one of the few games I've gotten from them via Kickstarter with a few upgraded components and a nice UV uh, box uh, art here with the kind of raised, shiny stuff there. Uh, this game has a very unusual-shaped board, that looks like an alien egg. And the premise of it is really silly. You're a bunch of townsfolk in Nevada who are going out and getting eggs and delivering them to the government uh, near Area 51 and whatnot. And there are monsters that will come out of the ground via these cards that you are adding when you make noise. And then they will spew a bunch of rubble and eggs and damage you if you're too close. But you can attack them with all kinds of weapons and stuff. And you can collect all these weapons and just use them all up in one go. It's a really silly game. But it's the one game I have that's in the pick up and deliver genre where it's like, you know, you're, you get stuff and you're trying to take it somewhere else. I'm not really a, normally a big fan of this genre, but I, I like the way it plays out here because it's really silly. It's not particularly anything lengthy. The box is 45 to 60 minutes. You'll probably be playing longer than that on a first game. But it's really fun and the, the whole excitement of a worm coming out of the ground is just... It's really just filled with a lot of tension and a lot of excitement around the table. You also have these really silly characters, and you have little uh, what you call them, like items here. Uh, some of them are are like hats that give you special powers, you know, which is really silly in real life. But in the universe of this story, it, it makes total sense because why not, right? It's it's not exactly a very strategic game or a very thinky game or anything like that, but it is a fun game. And uh, I'm not sure how long I'm going to hold on to it, but with certain groups, I like bringing this one out. It's a lot of fun. All right, that is it for um, shelf number five. So next time, we're going to be going over to what I call the Renegade shelf. This is the one that has a lot of games by uh, Renegade Game Studios. 
And with that shelf, this is going to end the first row. So I'm really excited. So until next time, everybody, thank you all so much for watching. If you liked today's video, don't forget to smash that like button, comment and subscribe if you haven't already, and ring that bell to get notified of the next one. And until then, I will see you next time. So take care, and I will catch you in the next one.